Now, I want to put up a picture. Who knows what this is? All right? This is a picture that appeared in National Geographic this past year in an epic uh, edition called Planet or Plastic. And you, some of you probably also saw, not around the same time, this video of the sea turtle with the straw, plastic straw on its nose. How many saw that? Okay, look at that, all right? That is amazing impact. And it's had amazing impact throughout. Several of our student storytellers and our correspondents this year focused in on this affliction and this crisis that the planet faces with plastic. And let me just roll a quick clip from one of our student storytelling teams, um, Deanna Reyes and Deanna Klarkowitz. Are the Deannas in the room? Where are you guys? Where are you? There, okay. Just take a look at what one student team put together on this topic. Humans love plastic. Since large-scale production of the stuff began in the early 1950s, we've put over 18.2 trillion pounds of it in the trash. That's equivalent to the weight of one billion elephants. We're just getting started. It is estimated that by 2050, 26.5 trillion pounds of plastic will have been produced worldwide, equaling the weight of 72 million Empire State Buildings. It's okay though, right? Most of our plastics get recycled. <coughs> Wrong! A whopping 91% of plastics aren't recycled. 91% of plastics are not recycled. This is the power of a data point, right? People take their plastic, they throw it in recycling, they think, okay, we're done, we're good. We're not, we're not. I, uh, so how about a round for the Dianas, right? <laughs> Was that like mind-blowing when you saw that 91% of plastics had not been recycled? Yeah. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, it was for, the, for, 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 I think, anybody who saw it. Okay, so now I want to bring up our first speaker, Tom Zaki, because this is Tom's work. The first time I met Tom, um, it was in Trenton, New Jersey, in um, the headquarters of TerraCycle. Anybody in the room heard of TerraCycle? Wow, look at that. You're famous already and you haven't started yet. Um, what I discovered was this kind of mad scientist of garbage. Like he's really into garbage. And he's into garbage because he's wanting to do something with it. His entire company is focused on taking this trash and making it reusable in some form or another. And as this planet drowns in plastic, he's doing amazing things and he's going to tell you about it. But he's also connecting the story behind it to the mission, which, as we talk about impact, helps him have more impact. It's why you all know about it already which raises your consciousness. I just want to say this about Tom. He's the winner of the United Nations Momentum for Change Lighthouse Activity Award. He's the recipient of the 2017 Green Sustainable Business Achievement Award. He was in Davos, and he's going to tell you a little bit about what he was doing in Davos at the World Economic Forum, working with some of the largest companies on the planet to make change. Would you welcome Tom Zak? <laughs> and when, when, Tom, when, and when Tom is done, um, we'll contain him. When Tom is done, I'll come back and you can um, have an opportunity to ask him some questions. It's all yours. Thank all you. Right. Welcome. Thank you all. It's a real, real honor and privilege to, uh, to be with you today. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this uh, story of waste, how we look at waste, what we try to do with it, and also to show you how we're interacting with this idea of story uh, and the media. And on that point, I'm going to start with a little video to give you a sense of how at least the media perceives TerraCycle. An average American produces 4.5 pounds of waste per day. While recycling is now commonplace for some materials, many polluting products are still destined for landfill. On this Earth Day, we want to take a look at the future of environmentalism, eco-capitalism. Hey, it's a big win. It's good for the planet, good for the economy. At a new eco-capitalist company called TerraCycle, whose motto is, there's no such thing as garbage. Dubbed the Google of garbage, TerraCycle is an innovative company taking things like toothpaste, tubes, chippy bags and cigarette butts and turning them into eco-friendly products. Our goal at TerraCycle is to try to avoid waste ending up in our landfills, incinerators or even our oceans. And what we do here is we construct national programs where people can collect waste streams that have no recycling solution on them today. Everything from cigarette
butts to latex gloves to chewing gum and all sorts of different things. Collect them and then process them in a circular way so the materials go around again. The key to garbage really is that everything can be recycled. There's simply no exception. It's one of economics. We recycle everything people thought couldn't be recyclable. Things like cigarette butts, chewing gum, dirty diapers, even femcare waste. I mean, you name it. So this is a finished shipping pallet that is made from our recycled cigarette waste. Plastic is made from 30% used chewing gum. TerraCycle is taking dirty diapers and melting them into park benches. We've created the world's first recyclable shampoo bottle made with beach plastic. We typically donate a small donation of about two cents per piece of waste you collect to your account and we pay a few million dollars out every year uh, in these form of donations. By showing companies that they can win by investing dollars in social good and purposeful activities, they will do more of those things. We're in this to show that you can be a very successful social enterprise with the key goal of eliminating as much waste from being burned or buried as possible while being profitable. So, thank you. That gives, gives you a little context uh, of what we do and how it's seen. This is where we operate today around the world. We are uh, proudly headquartered in Trenton, New Jersey, and if you're ever through Trenton for any crazy reason, please please drop in and check it out. It is like a sort of Willy Wonka facility uh, uh, in, in what it looks like if you've ever been through. Um, one of the things you'll notice, by the way, is all the countries where we operate are wealthy, rich countries. Uh, and uh, what we've noticed in waste is that there's a big difference between developed countries, like here, where litter is really not the main issue. The main issue is moving from disposal to recycling, maybe aspirationally reuse. And in emerging markets, it really all goes to litter. It's, it's incredible uh, uh, the amount of waste that's produced because there isn't the infrastructure. So actually with a, the TerraCycle Foundation, our public charity, we're now opening in Thailand and India to try to combat it from a more foundation model because the business models work quite differently. So I think what's really important, especially as you communicate a story or on us try to solve a problem, um, is not just to accept the problem for the, you know, the, uh, that it exists, but to take a step back and understand why does this problem exist to begin with. Having that context, I think, is critically important no matter how you address it. So let me take you on a journey of waste. Waste, you know, I think we'd all agree, doesn't exist in nature. Um, so then the question is, when did it emerge in the human system? And I've written a number of books on this, and I would really argue after researching it that it's about 1950 when this happened. These are actual advertisements promoting disposability. You know, you'd look at these now as one of those cigarette advertisements saying that your physician, you know, uh, recommends you smoke a camel cigarette to, to stay calm. Um, and it's like, you know, what were the people in the 50s thinking, right? The important thing to think about in these ads uh, is not just how sort of weird they are today, uh, but what they're promoting. And why did disposability win? And why do we constantly vote for it every day? I mean, we voted for it in breakfast by picking up a disposable coffee cup, uh, and so on and so forth. And the reason is because it's incredibly convenient and really affordable. And I think it's important to also think about the virtues that create the problems, not just to vilify them. Because it's very easy to say, plastic sucks. Um, it, it, the media has gone very big on that. But yet, you're in plastic right now, sitting on plastic. Your feet are on plastic. I'm talking through plastic devices. You know, we are live longer because of plastic and so on. So it's also important to note those virtues as you think about what are the negative repercussions. Now, of course, everyone knows about ocean plastic. 25% of our plastic ends up there. Um, uh, globally, somewhere between 2 and 9% of the plastic is recycled. It's a range that's hard to get a real specific number on it. And it is decreasing. It's decreasing because oil is cheap, and that's what plastic competes against. It's decreasing because end markets, China and now others, Vietnam, Thailand and others, are stopping to import our waste, which is where it all ended. And it's also decreasing because the quality of the waste is going down, making it less profitable for recyclers to deal with it. Uh, and that's because pla uh, packaging is becoming lighter and more complicated. Both of those drive higher costs to access a lower amount of value. So where does it all go? It basically gets burned or buried. That's the, uh, that's the primary global solution to all this stuff. So I want to take you on a journey of how we try to solve this a little bit. You know, the first thing, what TerraCycle as a brand is really known for, is taking things that can't be recycled and getting them to be recycled. Um, so you know, solving this first step of the equation. Now, I want to show you first that everything, everything with no exception, can go in a circular process. We first look at, can things be reused? Here's how 35 million plants were packaged at Walmart a few years ago, directly in used uh, margarine containers. Um, whether they can be upcycled, here's how a quarter million soccer balls were made for the World Cup a few years ago. Um, whether it's uh, uh, bags from candy wrappers, whether it's you know, promotional ideas, it's always important to think about how do you create excitement and how do you create 
uh, 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 volume. Upcycling, things like this, are really fun to create excitement. Here's a, you know, someone you may know wearing you know, a, a jacket we made for him from used chip bags. And if you think from a corporate point of view, he's actually promoting two products in this photo. You may notice the other one, Ben & Jerry's, but notice which one gets all of your attention, right? So this is very important as we work with corporates to try to get them to release funding into these activities. Um, if you're ever through our office, every one of our offices around the world in 21 countries, every detail is made from garbage. And that's cool because then the New York Times ends up calling it the coolest office in the United States. Uh, there's big, you know, it recruits a lot of interns, a lot of amazing uh, uh, team members to come join us to be a part of it. But the real foundational solution to waste, the volume of it, is the science of it, taking things apart and making them into new materials. Cigarettes, for example, we recycle in 11 countries around the world. About a billion cigarettes have been collected, number one cause of roadway litter, by the way. Um, and they get shredded, the ash tobacco paper is composted, the filters, which are made from a plastic called cellulose acetate, is made into these types of objects. Um, here are shipping trucks for the Super Bowl, made 30% uh, from used potato chip bags, all the way to outdoor gyms made from aerosol containers. Now, the important aspect in all of this, uh, sorry, I'm going to go back a step here, apologize, Oops. is that it's, it's to release the ability to get big funding to do this on a global basis, it's always thinking about how do we make sure that when we collect and recycle aerosol containers, we can benefit and highlight the organizations that are funding it, in this case, someone like RightGuard. Now, since we're here in a communication conference, one of the things TerraCycle's been really good at is telling uh, uh, the story. We find that you know, by being able to make it very human, making it very visual, uh, uh, really makes something that may just you know, usually sound like tons of material moving around incredibly exciting. We also really believe in trying to become a part of the media, not just being written about by the media. So when you know, newspapers write about us more than once, we start blogging for them. We do this for now, you know, from the New York Times to Huffington Post, all sorts of places. We try to write books uh, to put out our f way of thinking. And we've had a chance now to put four you know, uh, publications out with the last one just coming out last month on waste and you know, the topics around waste. For us, the pinnacle of our own media enterprise has been having our own uh, reality TV show. We did a season on the National Geographic Channel, then three seasons on the Pivot Network. Um, and I'm going to show you a little clip of it. But the biggest thing we learned in this process is that you have to first serve the medium and second serve the mission. Uh, because that's what gets you to become highly rated. That's what gets a lot of engagement. So in the first season on the National Geographic Channel, it was all about you know, the recycling and the science and so on. And we did a season, but we didn't get a second season, which is you know, basically we got canceled. But then when, when we went over to the Pivot Network, we reframed it as a comedy. And it became the number one TV show on that network, until the network went bankrupt. And then at least we didn't get canceled. But we, uh, we were there for three years doing really well. It's called Human Resources. And I'll give you a little taste of what this show looks like. I started TerraCycle in my dorm room in Princeton, ended up dropping out, then uh, found a space in Trenton, partly because it was cheap, and started running the company full time. TerraCycle's job is to charge companies uh, to collect waste. Then we convert that garbage uh, into usable raw materials, which we then sell as well. So basically, anywhere in the country, people can send us their packaging absolutely for free, and we'll recycle it for them. And with WellPet, we're launching the first brigade anywhere in the world where we can recycle pet food packaging. Colgate is one of our largest global partners around the world. We uh, today collect and recycle millions of pieces of oral care waste every single month and to partner with the world's most important oral care brand is truly an honor. I regularly meet with David Greenberg, the head of Garnier in North America. You know, we're now able to recycle cosmetic waste uh, through your generous support at Garnier. Last year, we created the first community garden made entirely from recycled personal care and beauty waste. This here is a zero waste box. This is our small box and you can fill it up with any form of waste. Send it to us and we'll separate it and then we'll recycle it into something new. It's the first time that every type of garbage in the world can be recycled at a price. We have a box for everything. Anything that a normal consumer could put in the mail and not get in trouble for. We got a box for that. We got a box for that. I wanted to learn a bit more about sustainability, environmentalism, and TerraCycle is such a unique kind of company. So I'm pretty stoked to be here. And we have Andrew. They talk about Barack Obama this, Barack Obama just did that, vegan food. Oh, God. Are you kidding me? There's people bringing the dogs to work. They're always talking about the environment. I don't know why. The environment seems fine to me. So we do have everyone involved in, in, in the company. Um, just some fun ex examples of this type of work. This just launched a month ago, diaper recycling in Amsterdam, and it's now spreading around the world. And to give you a sense of what makes this go around beyond, OK, it's cool, we recycle diapers and all that jazz, is that 
The way this type of platform works is, you know, you get an app by Pampers uh, where you can find all these diaper recycling bins across Amsterdam. You click the one you want to visit, gives you a barcode, you present it to the bin, it opens, lets the bin open, you put your dirty diapers inside, and then it weighs them and it gives you coupons uh, into or discounts into Pampers. And that, the, the business model is how do people switch from the competitive brand to Pampers, but it's done through the mode of diaper recycling. And when you can unlock that, that's what creates major scale. Because if you just went to the company and said, hey, take responsibility for being 3% of our landfills and, and you know, being a, a big waste problem, it wouldn't go that far. It's really important to always frame into the stakeholder uh, that you're working with, especially if you're trying to push purposeful or social missions, because they care about maybe different things than what we care about. Um, so whether it's, here's an example in DM, which is like the CVS of Germany, where it's about recycling aerosol containers, and for every 400 aerosol containers, a high-end bicycle is made for a child in need, donating over a million euro of bicycles and recycling millions of aerosol containers in the process. Whether it's car seats at Target, this platform, which is recycling baby car seats, is not only a massive driver of car seat sales for Target, which is what they really care about, but also recycles a uh, 250 full truckloads of used car seats every month. I mean, it's a ridiculous scale of all these different waste streams when you really think about it. Even cities, uh, uh, whether here in DC, but 400 cities around the world do cigarette recycling. And most recently in Mexico, we just launched chewing gum recycling. So in all cases, it's about how do we think through how the waste stream behaves, what are the stakeholders who care, and then how to really get it out there and make it as absolutely big as possible. But that's only the first step, which is how do we make things recycled? The second step is how do we get waste back into objects? And here is where story is critically, critically important. So what we run is actually a division called storied materials. Uh, because one of the challenges in getting recycled material back into products is that usually companies will say, I want to use recycled content only if it's the same price and same quality as the new stuff. And that is almost never the case. And that is why most of the objects that we interact with are made from new materials or basically extracted oil. And it, it's because recycling is not cheap. You know, It takes money to be able to collect all this stuff and, and do it. And we do hundreds of different materials. But I want to take you on the one that is the most topical today, ocean plastic. Here's one of our key, uh, cleanups in the San Blas Islands in Panama. This is an aboriginal community where when you look horizontally, it's paradise. When you look down, it's, it's not so much. And it's, they don't even have disposability on these islands. It just washes all up. And this is there's not just the big Pacific garbage patch. It's everywhere. It's, abs it's in our drinking water. Everyone here, if you drank any liquid this morning, you have drank microplastics. So cheers, you know, and it's all in us. Uh, but it's also, it's not just the great Pacific garbage patch. It is ubiquitous. It's absolutely everywhere. So this is how that ends up. This became, we launched this at the World Economic Forum uh, in 2017. The world's first shampoo bottle made 25% from ocean plastic and recyclable. And that's all great. Um, but I want to tell you the business model behind it, because I think that's much more interesting than just that this exists. Head & Shoulders, which is the number one shampoo in the world, um, uh, do you guys know what color usually the bottle is? It's not this. White. OK, I ask you that because that is the iconic nature of their product. No one can remember the logo, but everyone remembers blue top, white bottom. So getting them to change the bottom is incredibly difficult. And this is the first time in their history they changed the color. And that's actually a degradation. That wasn't a positive. That was something that they had to, to really sacrifice to do. But also, the cost of ocean plastic is exceptionally more expensive than normal plastic. So both of these premises of has to be the same price and same quality were foundationally broken, not just a little bit. And the reason was story. One of the most interesting things you know, that, that we learned is that these companies, P&G is one of the biggest advertisers in the world, so they're buying paid story all day long. That's what advertisements are. But advertisements are becoming progressively less credible, less, more dollars have to be spent to get the same amount of sales lift. Um, and it's a huge, ridiculous budget. So where we went to them is we said, look, take some of those advertising dollars that you're gonna spend on commercials, don't spend on commercials, instead put it into the plastic and subsidize the ability for it to be made from substantial quantities of ocean plastic that allows us to do cleanups all over the world. Um, now in every continent, uh, we, this is the largest active supply chain for ocean plastic today in the planet. And it's cleanups from New Zealand to Brazil, you know, from the oceans, rivers, lakes, and so on. 
Um, and then the R&D that has to be t put into it to turn that into a plastic that can survive in a bottle like this and have the quality and so on uh, uh, that's needed and still be locally recyclable. And when they did that and took that risk, what was amazing is it did better than uh, the other bottles without a dollar of advertising. And it's because the story became so powerful. It galvanized the media. Uh, it did that in, uh, with consumers. And one, the biggest lesson was that people want purpose, especially in a news cycle that is so ridiculously negative, whether you live here in the US you know, with you know, Trump all the way to Brexit or right-wing natures in Brazil or Eastern Europe. There's so much negative in the media that people want to feel positive in some way, which is also a challenge to you in writing is you know, think about how to talk about what's good because it's overwhelmingly bad. And if you are swimming an overwhelmingly bad narrative, then you are paralyzed and you don't do anything different. That's one of the biggest challenges in sustainability communication. I think it's 99% the world is ending. And then at the end, it's like, well, turn your light bulb off when you leave your home. And it's like, well, those aren't balanced <laughs> concepts. And then I might as well fuck it and just party because the world's gonna end. I can't do anything about it, right? We need to empower this positivity, the inspiration that there is a way to solve because there is. Once this launched, uh, uh, it then flew to 20 countries around the world and it continues to grow. It then recently came, you may not know this bottle unless you're European, but this is Dawn in the US. It's the first 100% recycled dish soap bottle made 10% with ocean plastic. And I remember a funny story here. The uh, head of R&D at Procter & Gamble who makes this product called and said, I'm sort of annoyed by this. I said, why are you annoyed? He goes, well, we worked for two years with incredible focus and, and it was really, really tough to make this bottle from 100% recycled material. And I was like, yeah, and that's pretty awesome. And he goes, yeah, I know, but you guys put, made, took 10% of it, turned it, you know, used ocean plastic, and only you guys get the credit for this, and everything we did, no one cares about. And, it, and my answer to him was, well, you just defined the difference between steak and sizzle. You're the steak, and this was the sizzle. And that is, there's a purpose for that, to move those things forward, because without it, if, if the 100% recycled plastic bottle didn't sell, it may not survive. Here's the same thing with high-end luxury skincare with Unilever, and many, many other examples. But I want to tell you that nothing you saw is the answer so far. Because recycling is the solution to the symptom of waste and not to the root cause of waste. It's equivalent to us cleaning up the ocean is critically important, but it's not going to do anything if we don't stop putting stuff in the ocean. Because if you combine every ocean cleanup project in the world, everything together, you know, including ours and all the other great work that's happened, I bet you that all of it in its lifetime has taken about a few hours worth of input out of the ocean in context, right? It's just so disproportionate. So we have to do both. Both are important. We have to clean it up, we also have to stop it. And so this took us on a journey of, well, how do we solve the root cause of waste? And in thinking about it, the answer to us became, it's not plastic, that's the problem. It's not anything, it's using all this stuff once sort of dishonoring the idea of how amazing plastic is if we use it for five minutes and throw it out. And that begot the third model that, uh, 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 called Loop, uh, which is all about how do we redesign away from the very concept of waste. So I'm gonna take you on again, and by the way, this was the press conference. This was at uh, Davos at the World Economic Forum just about three months ago, in late January. Uh, it was myself, the CEO of P&G, Pepsi. The most exciting person on the panel to me was actually the lady, Jennifer. She's the global CEO of Greenpeace. And it was actually the first time Greenpeace and Procter and P&G all got on the same stage together because they're not really friends. So at least P&G and Pepsi are friends, but the, you know, Greenpeace is a little bit more challenging of a relationship. So it's actually quite exciting that that's how it began. I'm gonna play you a little clip of, again, how did the media interpret this, and then tell you all about it. We'll get ready to say goodbye to disposable containers. Recycling company TerraCycle announcing a zero waste delivery service called Loop. It's called Loop. It follows what is called the milkman model. Imagine the milkman meets everything. For everything from orange juice to deodorant. Laundry detergent. His ice cream or shampoo are delivered. In durable and reusable packages. Inside a reusable shipping tote. When you are done with them, without any cleaning, instead of putting it into a rubbish bin or a recycling bin, you put it into a reuse bin. Une fois les produits 
produit consommé, le client replace les contenants utilisés dans le même sac. Unilever's design team is working on their own redesign. Major brands including Nestle, Procter and Gamble and PepsiCo. Tropicana, Tide, Hagen Dazs, Procter and Gamble, Unilever and 23 other companies. We've got a test that will be going initially in New York and Paris. Launch in May in Paris and then New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. We're not only rethinking recycling, we're rethinking how we use every single product. The e-commerce site says its model is nearly 75% better for the environment. It moves from being disposable to reusable. And my dream is that my kids or their kids can wake up in a world where the idea of waste simply doesn't exist. Mm. And we look at this time in history as what an anomaly that was, and thank God we're not in it anymore. Thank you very much. So that gives a little, thank you. Again, as I started in the beginning, I want to take you on a journey here because to innovate foundationally, I think we have to look at why problems exist and really understand them and honor them, and then we can take a step forward because without that context, we're solving in the dark. So let's take that on a journey around disposability, which I would argue is the root cause of waste, this idea of using something once. Back in the 1930s, this is how products came to you, but not just milk, motor oil, perfume. I mean, so much stuff came in a model like this, the quote-unquote milkman model. And what's the most unintuitive about it is who owned the package. In this model, the dairy owns the package, which means they are selfishly, financially motivated. Forget the word sustainability, it didn't exist in his time. They're selfishly motivated to make that package as long-lasting and durable as possible because that is what makes it cheaper per use. Per use is defined as the cost of the package over the number of uses. So a $1 package with 10 uses is 10 cents. A $5 package with 100 uses is 5 cents per use. Then what happened? By the way, again, this is an advertisement actually promoting disposability. So what are they promoting here? That it's convenient and affordable. You don't have to do the dishes, just throw them out. But an interesting change happened. In th when this occurred, like today, because we're still in this, this is our lives today, the package became property of the consumer. Now, how many people here drank orange juice or coffee this morning? Raise your hand. Okay. Just keep them up for a moment. We're going to do a little exercise, okay? I did too, by the way, so I'm just as much in this with you guys. Um, when you took the coffee or orange juice, the university or the conference gave you, right? No one was stealing, right? That was a gift <laughs> giving to you the orange juice and the coffee. But the university and, or the conference also gave you the cup. Now, if your hands are up, keep them up if you're going to cherish your property for a very long period of time, because it is your property. Did, is anyone in that? Are you, no? Are you? No? No? OK. No one. Well, I put my cup in the coat rack. Are you going to keep it? Yeah, I don't know what I'm doing with it yet. <laughs> right on. The only smart man in the room, because it's your stuff, right? I mean. So it asks the, it begets a question, why should we own things we don't want to own? And we only own those things for about a half hour. And that is not just a problem for us, it's a problem for the people who made it because the goal of the company who provided the coffee cups this morning is to make that coffee cup as cheap as possible because it's what's called a cost of goods sold to them. It's something that is a throwaway expense. And when you make things as cheap as possible, they become progressively less recyclable. If you take a journey on beverage containers, you know, uh, glass bottles were reused at 95% when they were reused in the United States, then aluminum cans at 60% recycling, PET bottles at 25%, cartons at 10%, and pouches at 0%, and that's the way beverage packaging is trending. And as things become cheaper, they become less exciting and less recyclable. So the idea of Loop is to foundationally shift ownership from you, the consumer, back to the manufacturer. So everything in, you're going to see in a minute is all owned by the manufacturer. The consumer simply borrows it. And so when you access your Tropicana or your haagen or whatever, you pay the same for the content, the orange juice or the ice cream, and you put a deposit on that beautiful container and you get it back in full once you've returned it, no matter what shape you return it in. And durability begets really three things. Things become reusable, which is foundationally better for the environment. Think, you know, the first thing we ever learn in sustainability, reduce, reuse, recycle. And by the way, the lesson there is don't buy is actually the very best. But within the idea of purchase, reuse is, of course, much better than uh, recycling. But you also get more than that. 
you get beautiful design, a whole breakthrough in how products look and feel, and those products can have new features. Whether it's an ice cream container made from stainless steel that allows your ice cream to stay frozen longer, whether it's uh, 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 olive oil now packaged in beautiful reusable packaging, whether it's Coca-Cola bringing back its iconic bottle you know, from the 1920s, whether it's Pepsi redesigning back into reusable packaging, uh, whether it's something like this, like your new deodorant container, which looks closer to an iPod than it does to normal deodorant you would buy at Walgreens. Um, whether it's mouthwash, whether it's shampoo, and this is an interesting, I put this up because you can see Pantene's Loop version for 2019, but they already released next year. And the only difference, they're both technically reusable, the only difference is the next level of design. And one of the really interesting things is that the way you increase durability, these new unlocking principles have come out, which is that it's not just about beautiful materials and, and really durable content, but it's also about making things age beautifully. Because if you can allow something to age, it can keep going around. That's why the new Pantene bottle, it's sort of hard to see, has two layers of metal. Because the outside layer gets scratched more, the inside layer less. And as the scratching continues, it becomes more visible, the logos. So aging beautifully becomes a new idea. Whether it's you know, the way you do dish pods, uh, you know, your new laundry detergent, everything can move into this new archetype. And it, this way, the goal is that you don't sacrifice convenience of disposability. You still throw these packages out. You don't sort them, you don't clean them, you throw them out. You're just happening to throw them into a reuse container versus a landfill container or a recycling bin. So hopefully this shows you a little bit about how we try to look at the world of waste just a little differently. And what you'll notice in all of these, the idea of storytelling is so critically important because without that, none of you would know about it um, and, or, or no one would be passionate about it. Uh, so with that said, I really am thrilled to be here this morning. Thank you so much, uh, and have a wonderful conference. Awesome. All right, so <clears throat> what we like to say is, you know, stories that inspire, right? So you were doing that. We talk about compelling characters. I think you're compelling. I think this stuff is compelling. We, got, we know what the obstacles are. They're everywhere. Who's got a question for Tom Zaki? Uh, tell us who you are, where you come from, and go fire away. Uh, do we have mics? Let's do the mic so that our live stream audience and everybody else can hear you. And I'm going to ask you to keep your questions as short as you can, answers as short as you can, so we can get as many in as we can. All right. Ooh. Go ahead. So I have two questions. Don't um, worry about it. I'm Anna Lindquist. I'm from Eckerd College. I'm a senior. Um, Put that mic closer so we can hear you. Okay. Uh, my first question is, um, as a scientist, uh, we use disposables in the labs every day. So what is your opinion on plastic use in hospitals and labs? And then the second question is, as a zero waster, low waster, I've been on a zero waste journey since about 2017. So what do you think about the zero waste, low waste? Sure. Uh, so first question was hospital medical, one of the biggest creators of waste, by the way, you know, between personal protective equipment, you know, all the sterile wrap, all this stuff that it comes from. We do a lot in our recycling service around like plastic latex nitrile gloves, you know, beakers, pipette tips, all those things. Um, so there's some, you know, let's bring as much recycling into that environment as possible. The challenge is actually legal. In many cases, you can't legally do anything but do red bag incinerations. So that's a, a legislative problem. Um, and uh, we're gonna be, ex first, like with a reuse model like Loop, we're gonna do the easy stuff, which is, you know, consumer-based. But there's already some experiments happening in the B2B sector. Um, the real challenge in that is the regulatory nature, because regulation is addicted to, st you know, sterile uh, things. And in not all cases, that it has to be sterile. There's appropriate things that need to be, but we overdo it in that industry. So that's more of a legal question. On your second question about the zero waste movement, I think it's absolutely fantastic, and congratulations on, on, on what you're doing. I think we need the foundational problem, and this is, I think, if there's any message you take away from me, it's this. It's the foundational problem to every sustainability issue in the world, whether you care about climate change, waste, air quality, um, species reduction, deforestation, you name it, it all actually emanates from one and only one action, which actually is great, because we can solve one thing, which is consumption. Buying things is the genesis of every problem we have in the environment, with no exception. The best thing to do is don't buy. Don't buy loop stuff, don't buy anything. That, and I know, you know you're laughing, but someone alive today buys 10 times more stuff than someone alive 100 years ago. Here's a question, I know this for, for, for uh, ladies, so I apologize, I'm gonna vilify the, the uh, uh, purchase habits of women a little bit, but take a guess. In 1920, if you were a middle income Parisian lady, how many garments would you have bought per year? Throw it out. Five. Two. How long would have they lasted in years? 10 years. 20. 
today, same, same matrix, nine, 2019, middle-income Parisian lady. How many garments does she buy per year? 65. You're the same, by the way. I just happen to know it for France. The US is even a little more. And how many, you can't do time anymore. How many uses before disposal? Three. That's the average. Now, I'll say, I'm, you may know someone, probably not you, but you may know someone who's bought a garment, put it in her closet. I've worn this 500 times. Thank you. <laughs> That's why we're- That's we're, why the elbows are going and the pockets are- <clears throat> You know, how many, have you met anyone who's, you know, bought a garment, put it in, in their closet, never worn it and thrown it out, at, uh, when, cause when they've looked at it, it's gone out of fashion or that sort of thing. This is the problem. I'm gonna show, we're gonna show, in a minute, we're gonna see a video actually that two of our student correspondents did on garments, yep. and I'm gonna get you to comment Good. on that. Couple more questions. Over here, yes. Hi. Wait, let me get it, let's get the mic to you so everybody can hear. And tell us who you are, where you're from. Thank you. My name is Michaela Hendrick. Uh, I'm from SUNY Plattsburgh. So my question is for people who don't recycle at all, who choose not to engage in sustainability yeah. initiatives, why are Loop and TerraCycle more enticing than recycling programs for people? Great question. So I think TerraCycle, for anyone who doesn't care about recycling, is not more enticing. Where the TerraCycle platforms work are people who care, who want to do more just to be very fair. So when we say, what's the total potential of TerraCycle in a country, when we open, it's equal to the recycling rate of that country. So here, it's about 25% of people it could work for. To be just very sort of straight to that. In Loop, the way we try to really frame it, and I think why there has been such a momentum on it is that it's not a reuse platform. Because reuse platforms require massive inconvenience. You have to take heavy packaging, clean it at home, fill it in a store. It's ridiculously inconvenient compared to throw it out and buy a new one. And you sacrifice complex products, you sacrifice brands, major retailers, they don't participate in them. And so it's very inconvenient. You have to be pretty hardcore to do it, right? We view Loop as a durable platform that has two benefits. One is, yes, it's reuse, but unconsciously so, we echo the behavior of throw it out. Don't sort it, don't clean it, throw it like garbage. We want that you know, feeling to be the case, so the average person who doesn't care will do it. But then it's not just about that. It's about the most beautiful versions of those products that exist without even a, it's not even a step up in innovation on beauty, you know, on those packages. It's like a whole new ball game. So if you don't care about the environment and you just care about having a better life, you know, more beautiful stuff, then this is for you. And then you're unconsciously reusable. So our goal with Loop is not that anyone who's enlightened buys it. I don't care if you guys do. I want people wearing red hats in the middle of the country to be excited about it. <laughs> because if we do that, then we really change uh, uh, the world. And the, what consumers care about is convenience, affordability, and the shiny new object. And notice none of those three things are sustainability. So let's not delude ourselves. And let's not you know, say people should be better. And that's one of the biggest problems you know, of, uh, uh, of folks in the movement. You know, in social and it's one of the big problems in storytelling. It's yeah. this finger wagging yeah, yeah, yeah. thing. That, that's what a lot of the frame of the storytelling. Well, exactly, and why is it so polarized? Sacrifice, don't do this, you're bad if you yes. do this. Yeah. The, 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 the narrative, the subtext to this is, is this kind of finger waggy thing, and, and people the, hate that. They, and they'll go the other way. They'll go the other way. Right, I think if you think about examples, not let's, take, let's forget Loop for a sec, but take, Vegetarian movement and electric cars, just for a second, is comparing them. What has been the biggest breakthrough in the- That Tesla is a cool car. Yeah, that Tesla, if you've ever driven it, it's just a really good, fast car. It's faster than any petrol car. Right. That is the, that's the breakthrough on the electric car, not the, uh, you know, I'm gonna be better and drive my Prius, right, which is not as high performance of a vehicle. Do you have a Prius? No, I don't. Um, Do you have a Tesla? I have a hybrid and I'm, I'm, I'm getting an electric car, uh, but uh, right now it's a hybrid. But I'm also, <laughs> but it's also, um, uh, let's look at the vegetarian movement, right? So the num best action you can take if you take one action. How many vegetarians stuff. or vegans in the room? Go ahead. Hell yeah, okay, so we're indexing a little better here. So if you're not, if the best thing you can do in the world is don't buy. The next best is be vegetarian. If you just think of environmental impact by far, beef is the number one cause of you know, major environmental issues, deforestation, global warming, blah, blah, blah. The, what I think really broke through there is companies like Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger, where the burgers are just so freaking good and taste great and emulate the-, the, the, the Burger King is starting them in, in St. Louis. Castle, I mean, White Castle put Impossible Burger in, Burger King on, I think, Impossible as well. This is it, because then it's not about, you know, sacrifice, it's about, it's better. One more question from the audience, and then we're gonna, yeah. uh, okay, let's, wait, I wanna go to the back of the room. Go ahead. Yep. 
Um, hi, I know that you're working with- Tell us who you are, where you're from. Oh, I'm so sorry. My name is Sylvie Lucero. I represent the Physicians Committee for uh, Responsible Medicine. And um, I'm a big proponent of EWG verified products. Um, so I know that you're working with major corporations, but do you ever see that um, spinning off into <clears throat> the smaller um, organizations where I try to patron? Yes, absolutely. So. You know, in total, we have about 40,000 clients that we work with, and most of those are small organizations, small producers, small retailers, small, you know, places. What gets all the attention, right, uh, and wakes people up is not the, you know, small places doing something, or even the ethical places that they ought to, or they're already sort of in their mode, but the unexpected. So what we're really proud of and what gets sort of, you know, big global attention, which then galvanizes momentum, is working with big tobacco, big oil, you know, big farm. You also get a, you get a little beat up on that too, because some people might say that you're giving big corporations sure, sure. kind of the the, the the greenwashing way out, and they can say they're doing yes. this with you, but they're you're, fundamentally not changing their behavior. You're absolutely right. They're not advertising don't buy more. No, but they're putting advertising of buy more into now recycling systems. Okay, instead. but does that really help if they're still saying buy more? Um, well, I can't affect that. This is the point. If I walked into Philip Morris and said you shouldn't exist, which I actually totally agree with. You shouldn't exist, right? Um, I wouldn't get in the front door. It wouldn't happen. How many people have tried that? I mean, billions of dollars and huge momentum is spent on, I'm just using tobacco because we can all agree it's, 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 you know, it, it's the easiest industry to vilify. Right. There's still benefits of it, which is why people buy it, right? Um, but it is very easy to vilify. You, we could also vilify big oil, but we all use, patr every one of us probably patronize big oil in some way. In one way or another. Yeah. I mean, even if you bike to work, this place has heat in it, you know. Uh, you're, you're sitting on big oil, you're wearing big oil, you're standing on big oil, right? So, you know, it, it's, it's, we all are patronizing it. So the point being is that it's hard for us to walk in and say don't exist. So a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, of our storytellers this last yeah. year took on issues of waste. Yes. And I want to show a quick video, right. about Let's a minute it. and a half clip from, um, where is Victoria? Is she in the room? And on? So there you are. So we're going to, Victoria and on went on a journey to look at clothing. Nice. All right? All this unused clothing. And here's a clip from their video, and then we're going to talk, and you can tell them how they did on storytelling. Okay. We'll stand to the side. I met with the four women behind the DC Sustainable Fashion Collective at the sustainable pop-up shop called Tribute. You can also do second-hand and vintage, buy vintage, because particularly vintage clothes, they will build to last. And also the other cool thing that is for me about shopping second-hand is very rarely are you going to find something that everyone else has. To take a page out of the Sustainable yeah. Fashion Collective's uh, book, I went to check out some secondhand clothes for myself. The next stop is Georgia Avenue Thrift Store, which claims to have clothing for women, men, and children for as little as 19 cents. As you can see, I've got a ton of clothes here. Um, there's men's, women's, children, there's even home goods, uh, comforters, just like random knickknacks. There's basically anything you're looking for, you could find it here. Yeah. It's like fabulous. What? Like four dollars. The thing is with a store like this, you're gonna have to put in a little bit more work. You're gonna have to search, but if you do put in that energy, you can find some really cool, unique pieces that no one else is gonna have, and you'll end up looking really cool. All right. So, <clears throat> so the purpose of the way they did this was yes. sort of their journey, right? Yeah. They went out looking to, to see this. Not much out there, by the way. Of, I mean, this was decent thrift, but it, it doesn't exist very much. That's right. So first of all, what do you think about that kind of personal journey sort of yeah. storytelling? Follow I me. I think it's really, you know, the way to go. You know, in, in, in storytelling, what doesn't work in environmental storytelling, I think, is the aggregate story. You know, Meaning. if you started talking about it's this many tons, you know, if you strung all the clothing, I go to the moon and back 75 times. Like, people don't understand any of that. It, it, it loses the humanity of it, and it just makes big numbers. And once you get to a big number, any bigger number, it's the same, right? I think you have to tell it in the individual uh, 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 point of view. You know, the the what I would also add to it though is it's I think you know there's there's 
a lot of these unknown angles, right? So angles that you may want to explore as you think about this is what happens to the clothes they don't sell in those places? Yeah, what happens right? to the clothes they don't sell in those places? Um, yeah. yeah, we actually discussed that in the solar yeah. system. Yeah. Um, and so many of the clothes that they don't Here, take a mic, take a mic, take a mic. Um, a lot of the clothes that they don't sell in American thrift stores actually get sent overseas, yeah. um, which can be really disruptive to local economies. Can you expand um, on why that's, that's the case? I totally agree, by the way, but why yeah, is it disruptive? Sure. So um, when clothing in American thrift stores, such as Goodwill or Salvation Army, don't sell uh, here domestically, they get sent internationally. Um, even to you know more like uh, global South countries, um, and when they have our secondhand clothing, it's disruptive to their local economies because people are no longer buying the clothing that's made locally. Um, yeah, exactly right. So therefore, it disrupts you know the revenue in that country. That's right. If you're a t-shirt maker, how can you compete with a you know a kilo of t-shirts that were sold? Market price for t-shirts in that market are 19 cents a kilo is what they and sell for. And, and we're about to wrap because I need to move us yeah. on, but how, in how many cities across the country is something like this happening? Though? Well, this is, this is big, right? Uh, uh, there's a huge clothing you know, sort of donation uh, system. You can go to any sort of Goodwill. Most places of worship right. have it. Uh, Walmarts, you can drop it off. But just to echo that, let's put it into context. 95% of the clothing you donate goes abroad, 95%. Mm -hmm. right? It is monstrous, and it's because we just, there's too much. Right, uh, of people are wearing things three times. Yeah, I right. want to, in closing, by the way, one put one last plug onto clothing. Another sort of unknown angle on clothing uh, that needs to be written about, right? And it hasn't. We talk a lot about microplastics. I even reference we're drinking it. The vast majority of what people think microplastics come from are packaging, floating in the ocean, so on. And that is true. But over ninety, like eight percent of it, is not that. It's washing clothing. Most of your clothing today is either pure plastics, like a rain jacket, about one third of the clothing being worn here would be like nylons, polyesters. One third are hybrids. If your pants stretch, that means it's a cotton hybridized with a poly. And then about one third are natural materials. Natural materials, wool, six, silks, and others, cottons are okay. That's what we should be buying. But if you look at the plastic or hybrid plastic clothing, most of, uh, when you wash your clothes, little microfibers come off. It's the same thing you see in your dryer, the lint, but that comes off way more in the actual wash and there's no filters for it. And it doesn't get filtered out anywhere. And this is the crazy part. Remember that stat that you know, people can use clothing three times on average before disposal? 90% yeah. of the microfibers come off in the first three washes. And because after that, they've been knocked off in the progressively more and more, like your jacket, which you've worn 500 times. Yeah, I but imagine. I've never washed it. OK. <laughs> keep, your, way, keep your distance. By the, way, by the way, that is the answer. That's not consuming the idea of washing. You see? Yes, exactly. I just so, thought I was a slob. No, no, no. You're, <laughs> you're a servant to the environment I see. with your jacket. <laughs> But, I did it on purpose. But this is the point on why vintage and using <coughs> over and over is important is because then you also decrease that point. So punchline is if you're going to buy clothing, buy timeless, durable things that last. Okay, I'm, one last question for you, and yes. you've got to be quick because we're, yes. we're um, a lot of these students are going to go back to your campuses. Those of you who are going to be around next year, is one, in whatever year you're going to be, I hope you're going to be correspondents or write stories for yourselves or for us. On every campus, on every campus and in every community, there are recycling bins there and are, recycling sure. efforts. What's an angle to the story, Tom, that, yeah. that people should, could go back to their campuses with and say, I want to lean on my president or my, or, or my provost or my sustainability mm -hmm. dean yep, yep. or my students, my fellow young students, mm -hmm and come up with some interesting angle that would actually help You know, us. I think a really interesting one would, in the world of recycling yeah. on campus, would be to really understand w in certain areas why, so there's two I'd give you. One is track the unknown waste, you know, the, the stuff that isn't that coffee cup or that spoon, but is things like the, you know, the curtains on the windows, the linens on sheets, you know, where is sort of, what is, what is out there, because, you know, people will never realize the sort of unknown the waste that is behind us, you know, uh, that, that uh, so for example, if you go, you know, buy a soup at a, at a Panera or something, that soup came in the, a big plastic bag that was put in a plastic bag before you even saw it put in a cup in front of you. And we vilify the cup, but what about the stuff behind us, nice. the unknown? Um, another sure. area that you may want to think about is why is the campus <coughs> voting for, th uh, for things that are not recyclable? And what are the pressures that don't let them vote for things that are uh, uh, recyclable, like, say, buying, you know, cups that 
can't be recycled versus ones that are. Understanding that backdrop, you know, then moves it away from what you just said, finger pointing, right. to saying, that's really the issue, right? Yeah. Versus, let's just be better, because then, then you're not addressing the reason these things exist. Okay, so we've given you a story tip for, for your next uh, bit of investigation. And you're going to be around with us for sure. a while yeah. this morning? Yeah, I'll be around. So one other thing, <clears throat> if you flip your badge over, and if you have a green sticker on the back of your badge, you'll get a copy of Tom's latest book, and you can claim that at the registration desk during the networking break, and maybe if you're really nice and say please and thank you and promise to recycle the book after reading it 27,000 times and giving it to all of your friends, yeah. um, Tom will sign it for you. Thank you so thank much. You. Appreciate well, it. I, and, and I should, I should, I should point out one other thing. <clears throat> we are really, really pleased that Tom brings to us brings to the Planet Forward and our advisory council this expertise and these connections. I should also point one other thing out. Tom Lovejoy, the famous Tom Lovejoy, the godfather of biodiversity, who led the Planet Forward Story Fest winners deep into the Amazon rainforest two years ago, believes so deeply in recycling and reusing that he kept the socks that were given to him, a, what air, where did airline? United Airlines, and he's wearing the socks today. They say 747. And I guess if you follow Tom's advice, you'll never wash them. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.